Hi everybody, Keith Tanner here from Facebook Live, or from Fly Miata for Facebook Live, uh, brought to you by Facebook. And um, today I'm going to talk about shock design and preload. We get a lot of questions about preload, so we figured we'd talk about it. I have some things here to look at. And fundamentally what I'm going to be talking about is the differences between what I refer to as a one-piece shock body and a multi-piece shock body. One with adjustable body length and these are usually sold as having adjustable preload as well. So that's what we're going to be looking at. What is the fundamental difference between these two? First, let's get into some high school physics. As you may recall, springs have a constant rate. Uh, if you have a spring with, say, a 10 pound per inch rate, if you give it 10 pounds of weight, it will compress, or first, it will compress by one inch. 20 pounds, it'll compress by two inches. So, and it's, it's pretty much straight linear. There's some very slight variation right near the ends of the travel, but fundamentally, you know, if you compress it twice as far, twice as much load. Pretty easy to understand. So if you've got a, you know, these springs here are probably 450s, maybe, maybe 550s, something like that. If I put 450 pounds of weight on this, it'll compress by an inch. Easy enough to understand. So what's the preload that people talk about? Well, it's basically, in many cases, on a, on a spring when it's installed, it's not allowed to stretch to its full length. This thing, when it's fully extended, don't have one here, is just a little bit longer. So it's got some preload on it. It's actually loaded up a little bit. If this was loaded by an inch, if it was short, uh, shortened by an inch, it would have one, well, this is, I think, a 391-pound spring, 391 pounds of preload on it. That's pretty easy to understand as well. Basically, if you take this top off, this thing will launch into the air because of the stored energy in the spring. So a lot of people think that this has something to do with the spring rate, that it will have, this will somehow change the way the car works. And the thing is, it doesn't. Because all you're doing with this shock is just preventing this from extending any further. You're not really adding any weight on the spring. So when you go and put a car on this thing, as soon as you get past that initial load from the preload, which in this case, you know, it's not much. It's only a, a few you know, tens of pounds. The spring starts to compress, and it compresses at that same rate as before. So when you've got a car sitting on a, on a spring, with say 600 pounds of weight on that corner, or force on that corner, um, it will be compressed by the same amount. If it's a 600 pound per inch spring, it'll compress by one inch. Doesn't matter what it is, if it's not being allowed to extend all the way, it still will compress the same amount, and the ride height will be the same, the handling will be the same. You can sort of do a thought experiment with this, such as, what if we had two identical shocks, and one of them was allowed to extend much further than the other one, if it had a much longer shaft? At ride height, you'd never be able to tell. Everything would work exactly the same until this spring fully, fully extended, and then you have all that extra, all that extra um, shaft travel on the other shock. But the actual preload would be radically different, but the actual ride quality, the ride height, everything else would be identical just because that shaft was allowed to extend further. Think about that one a little bit. It does make sense. Um, but the, the end result is basically spring preload is not a thing when it comes to suspension tuning unless you get into really extreme cases where the preload is greater than the weight of the car, in which case you've really screwed up. So let's talk about the difference between single and double body shocks and where this whole adjustable preload thing comes from. So these are pretty easy to understand, um, these single, single body shocks. You notice that every shock that Fly Miata sells is a single body shock, and that's not an accident. Uh, this setup, the entire shock goes, you know, goes from here right, to the, right from the bottom right to the top, and that means that the entire shock can be used to store a shaft. It can be used to, you can put a longer shaft inside it. And that is important for when you're trying to get as much suspension travel as possible. You need as much shaft travel as possible. And in the rear of Miatas in particular, uh, pretty much all Miatas, um, right up to 2019, 2020, um, this is a problem. You, these things are completely stuffed full of shaft to get as much travel as possible out of that shock. These two-piece ones are literally two pieces. There is a shock insert, and then there's an adapter. And the nice advantage to this is it lets you use a generic shock insert that can be used on a bunch of different cars, and then a special adapter for that one instead of this, which is a custom-made shock for the Miata only. The downside is that because you've got to have room for this thing to screw back and forth, it can't be the full length. And you can see this on this shock. This is one of these. Out of my way, everybody. This is one of these shocks, and that's about where it sits. So you can see there's this much of the bottom of the shock is not being used at this particular ride height. 
So that's, that's shaft travel, that's overall suspension travel we just don't get. And this shock's even sitting a little short right now. In reality, normally if you're installing in a car looking for normal ride height, it would be that long. So again, look at that. Look at how much of the, sha of the uh, shock body we're not able to use for our shaft. We're giving up this much travel. It's not so much a big deal on the fronts like this one, but in the rears it can be pretty dramatic. Let's go over here. This is a rear shock for an NA or NE NB Miata. Um, these are notoriously short on suspension travel. So let's set it up so that a full droop to the same length. Come on out, you come. Yep, you're full extended. Extend this one, a little bit of pull. So there we go. We'll set these up so they're not the same length. So if we're going to have the same droop travel, we have to extend that this far. This is basically going to have the same, when you take the car off its wheels, this is how far it'll extend. Now here's where the problem comes. Look at the difference in height here. This is our suspension travel. We put the car on top of this. That's the compression travel you're giving up by having that two-piece shock fully extended. Well, you say, okay, no problem, whatever. I'm more interested in compression travel, so I'll just make this super short. So we shorten this up as much as we can, and the right length for this shock is actually either as short as possible or the point where you start rubbing control arms against other things or the wheel goes into the fender well or whatever, whichever comes first. In the case of this shock, as short as possible is the only option. And so now we have about the same compression travel. Now it's actually a little bit better on the Fox. The problem is when our suspension droops, that's how much travel we're giving up. So this setup is going to have about two inches less travel at the wheel. And if you own an NA or NAB Miata, you know how important that rear travel is. So the, li the packaging limitations of having this two-piece shock means you just don't get um, that adjustability. And you'll notice that we're not the only people who agree with, with single-piece shocks. Uh, 949 Racing, for example, their Zetas only come in single-length single bodies, I believe, because they understand the same things we do. If you want to take full advantage of your suspension, give yourself as much travel as possible, you need to use a single-piece shock. Now, we've had questions, how do you set up one of these things? What is the best way to do it? And I sort of bounced off that. The answer is set it to basically be as short as it can go without everything hitting everything. And then set your ride height using the spring perch. Because this is what will determine your ride height, the distance between here and here when the spring is compressed, when it's got something sitting on it. And if that sounds like the same thing you would do if you were developing one of these from scratch, you're pretty much right. That's how we develop these. We figured out how short can we make the shock body and get to our maximum compression travel. Then we put the longest shaft we can in it. And then you adjust the ride height by spinning the perch up and down. So, preload, it's not really a thing. You can't use it for suspension tuning. It's, it's a way to market a design choice, which is primarily effective for saving money, keeping costs down. Hey, it's always important. But trying to make it sound like it's a performance advantage, and it's not, because that just, it doesn't matter how much the spring is compressed at full droop like this. What matters is the distance between here and here when the car is sitting on its spring. That extra preload, that, that work you're doing to prevent the spring from fully extending doesn't make any difference once the car sits on there and squashes everything down. Do we have any questions over there? There are no questions. We have answered all the questions. The internet has no questions about spring preload. Not yet. All the marketing that has been put out there about how spring preload is somehow some sort of adva competitive advantage uh, turns out to be hookum. Uh, there is a disadvantage, of course, to these two-piece things, and that is weight. Um, you've got twice as much, you know, instead of having a single shaft, you've got this thing on here as well. There's actually a three-pound weight difference between these two setups. Um, this is eight and a quarter pounds. This is 11 and a quarter pounds. Um, that's, you know, more than 30% more. Uh, and a lot of that comes from having all of these extra parts stacked on here that you don't really need. It's a bigger body as well. There's more steel in this one, but you get the, uh, you get the idea. So I am looking at comparing, I am comparing obviously a very high-end suspension system to a fairly, we'll call it, let's call it a universal suspension system. 
But you notice the same thing happens. We look at our Bilsteins. They've got about the same right, the same uh, length as the as the Fox does. We look at a Tokiko. Great shock. Too bad it went into production. Yeah, it's right about the same as well. Um, so basically, this is fundamentally about the length of a factory rear shock, and everyone is using that except for some of these guys, where you just physically can't. It won't package. So that is why you don't see any two-piece shocks at Fly Miata. We have experimented with them. We've tested all sorts of different suspension travel or suspension setups, and that's why we went with a single piece. Um, our our obsession with suspension travel came when we started developing shocks for the Targa Newfoundland back in 2007 or so. And we discovered that because we knew we were going to be running over very rough roads, very, uh, very hammered roads, that we needed as much travel as possible. And we took those tra cars on the track and discovered that they worked better. You could hit berms better. The car was less likely to hit the edge of its suspension travel mid-corner. It could deal with crest better. And you could just generally, the track was wider. So that's why we're obsessed with suspension travel. Mazda is obsessed with suspension travel. I've spoken to the primary um, suspension development guy at uh, Singer. He's obsessed with suspension travel, and he's also got a rally background as well. So it's, you know, it's something we have learned over the years that this is far more important than you might think. We have a question. Well, I'm going to try to sum up a few questions with one. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about spring selection, in particular spring length? Okay. Things like that. All right. Spring selection. Um, spring rate is a whole. I'm not going to get into spring rate because that's that's obviously suspension tuning. Um, but I'll talk into things like spring length because obviously these things have very different spring lengths. And the most important thing you need from spring length is you need enough length to get away without coil binding. And coil bind is what happens when the spring goes solid. It's best illustrated with this thing because I can squeeze it by hand. So it's still working within its free length doing this, as soon as it gets completely compressed and it goes solid, that's coil bind. And your spring has now been replaced with essentially a solid steel tube. You can imagine what that does to your ride quality. That will rip suspension parts apart. Coney's in particular will rip the perches right off the shock if you do this. So coil bind, bad. Coil bind comes from the difference, or the, you, you uh, avoid coil bind by making sure the difference between fully extended and fully compressed is more than the shock shaft the travel of your, of your shock. You can actually use this a little bit of a guide to how much travel you can expect because I know for the ND, for example, there are some coilover systems that have five or six inch long springs, whereas at a properly set up ND has a shock with about seven and a half inches of travel. Obviously, those systems are very limited on uh, suspension travel because they don't even have a spring long enough. So you need a spring long enough so that effectively these gaps all add up to this number. Um, the higher your ride height, the longer a spring you need because you need more, more room for that. You've got it more compressed at, uh, when the car's sitting on it. Um, lower cars can get away with a shorter spring. There's really no problem with going too long as long as you can still package it. You know, in the front of a Miata, you get to the point where the spring starts to hit the control arm or it might hit the axle in the back. So that's too long, but the minimum you need is enough to have this distance. Now, as for these little helper, sometimes um, these little helper springs, Basically, once the spring is fully unloaded, like this one is, you're not getting a lot of benefit out of that last little bit of travel. There you go, right there. That's where the, where the spring basically stops working, unless you've got a fairly high rate in the secondary spring. This is just there to keep everything together. Otherwise, when you lift the car off the ground, it's hanging in the air like this one, all the hardware can literally just sort of fall out of place, and then you put it back down, your springs are sitting crooked, stuff goes bang, it's not very cool. So that's the primary reason for using springs like this. They don't have a big dynamic effect unless they are a fairly heavy rate like they are on the V-Maxes. In this case, you know, if this, if this car was running higher and the spring perch was up here and you actually had just a little bit of, little bit of preload just to keep things from moving around, um, then this wouldn't be necessary. If you do have a helper spring like this and it's fully compressed all the time, it's not doing anything. You can take it out and just move the perch up a little bit. Does that answer the question, do you think, Kyle? Okay, um, so yeah, I often use spring length as an indicator of the expected travel of the shock. And you can really see the difference here. Um, that's a two inch difference in length. Um, this shock is obviously designed to use as much travel as possible. This one, I'm pretty sure, is designed to be used as low as possible uh, because as soon as you start going higher, you will need longer and longer springs. 
we've actually found with the VMAX we had to extend the springs because people were running them higher than we expected them to. So we had to go to a longer spring to avoid, avoid the coil bind. If you do think you're having coil bind, the symptoms are when you hit a bump, most of them are okay, and then there's one that's a really hard, like metal on metal crashing feel. And I don't have any springs here that have done it, but you will get marks on your springs. It'll get little lines right where the two coils have come together. So you can tell if you're not sure if you're getting coil bind, you can actually, phys you can actually visually inspect your springs and just look for those little lines. If you're getting that, you need a longer spring or you need to lower your car or you need to do something to prevent it because it will break things. It's really not a very good place to be. Okay, well that is effectively what I came here to talk about today. Um, I hope it's answered some questions. I hope it's at least got you thinking about what it means to have, uh, to have a longer shaft or what, what the preload actually means. I'm gonna, give me 30 seconds, I'll be right back. 15 seconds, I have another show and tell. Where are they? There they are. I hope you enjoyed our brief interlude. Here's my example of two shocks, don't mind the development stuff, um, that look identical and would ride exactly the same, but would have radically different levels of preload. This shock is gonna obviously have two inches more preload at the same settings as this one will. This is a front and a rear ND, by the way. That's how long the shaft is on an ND, isn't that awesome? Huge. Um, but yeah, if, you, if I put the same, if I put this one on the back, I could get the same ride height, everything would act the same, but when I got to full droop, the one wheel would just keep going, this one would stop. And the preload would be radically different, but the car would act the same. So, there we go. That's probably confused lots of people. Uh, feel free to throw questions in the comment section. Um, we will do our best to answer them. Uh, we are happy to talk about this stuff. You can also give us a call. We have lots of suspension techs available in our tech line uh, or email, and we can help clarify some of this thinking if I was not clear enough. Otherwise, thanks for your attention, and we will see you again next week. Thank you.